Hello, everyone. I'm Janine Donnelly, Manager of Webinars for Independent Banker Magazine. And on behalf of ICBA and Independent Banker Magazine, I'd like to welcome you to our presentation. We will be holding a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. However, you can ask a question at any time during the event by entering it into the Q&A panel. If you experience technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the Q&A panel to alert us and someone will assist you. You may download a PDF version of the slide deck by clicking on the drop-down menu labeled Event Resources. You'll find that on the left side of your screen. And know that you can download the slides right from the platform without being disconnected from the webinar. Today's webinar, Maximizing Liquidity with Reciprocal Deposits, is sponsored by Rich and Tang Deposit Solutions. Our featured speaker today is Tom Nelson, Executive Vice President and Chief Investment Officer. Tom is responsible for overseeing the firm's FDIC-insured programs, sales and growth strategy, and product development initiatives. Tom is a frequent industry speaker throughout the bank, trust, and brokerage spaces, discussing the impact of regulatory changes in the short-term markets, bank funding, and FDIC-insured investment strategies from a growth and profitability perspective. So without further ado, Tom, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thank you very much, Janine. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I hope you find this, this time uh, informative and helpful. Uh, just to reiterate one thing that Janine said, please feel free to ask questions. Um, as the presentation goes along. I will do my best to answer them within the flow of the presentation. If not, I will answer them at the end of the presentation or for, you know, in some cases, people ask very detailed questions that we'll respond to uh, separately. But, but please, please feel free to ask uh, questions. So I just wanted to start with a brief overview of <clears throat> Rich and Tang, who we are, what we do, um, to, to uh, introduce ourselves to your firms. Rich and Tang is a market leader in FDIC-insured suite programs. We provide services uh, and cash management solutions, solutions specifically to a variety of intermediaries such as banks, broker-dealers, trust companies, RIAs, and others. I think one of the most important things for people to realize is that we provide no services directly to public customers. Everything we do falls through an intermediary such as yourselves. So you never have to worry about us competing with you uh, for the same customer. We've been involved in the cash management space since 1974. Uh, we, uh, we were one of the original money market mutual funds. So our, our experience in the cash management space for all of these types of customers is very long and, and, and very broad. We provide customers with strategic on and off balance sheet uh, liquidity solutions. We help banks. Uh, provide services to their customers while also helping them manage their balance sheet appropriately uh, uh, while providing these services to the customers. We've spent a lot of time working on a variety of reform, including money fund reform, reciprocal deposit legislation, which we will focus on today, as well as Basel III, and the implication that all of these regulations have um, um, on each other. It's important to note that, that the cash markets often work um, in conjunction with each other and none of these items are specifically siloed. So as I, as I said, we're going to focus primarily on, uh, or I think I said, the uh, Regulatory Reform Bill of 2018, which really made a significant change. Um, to how reciprocal deposits are used uh, and treated by banks, um, you know, after this bill is passed. The bill is best known as the Crapo Bill uh, after its uh, 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 main primary sponsor of the bill. It had very significant uh, bipartisan support, um, and and the bill in general focused on regulatory relief for co community banks, consumer protections, and some other things. 
it, it covers a very wide swath of things, but today really what we want to focus on is a very specific section that would be regarding um, uh, reciprocal deposits, their treatment, and how that change in treatment might be of significant importance uh, to banks. So if we look at specifically section, the section that we're referring to is section 202 of the Regulatory Relief Act. And the first point here is, is the most critical. Prior to this bill, reciprocal deposits by definition had to be classified as broker deposits, or the deposits that banks took back from these programs had to be uh, classified as broker deposits. That made those, the use of these deposits obviously less attractive than uh, other types of core deposits. And for a variety of reasons, a lot of banks shied away from the use of these deposits because of their treatment. But because of this new structure and because of the fact that banks are now allowed to um, treat up to 20% of their assets that are in reciprocal deposits as core up to a, a maximum of 50, uh, $5 billion, it's made the use of these programs significantly more attractive um, th than they had been uh, previously. What, the, what this has done is provide banks with the flexibility to move out of broker, of, I'm sorry, of collateralized deposits for their, specifically for their municipal customers and free up collateral. Um, collateral is a very expensive uh, proposition for many banks. This has allowed banks to free up those deposits, use reciprocal deposits instead of collateralized deposits, and provide their customers with a fully FDIC insured solution and not lose the customer and not potentially lose uh, the customer's balances. Through the use of these programs, banks now have a product that that is balance sheet friendly, but also provides um, something that they can, can compete very easily with the too big to fail, very large banks where, where you know, unfortunately there's been a situation where large corporations, large individuals have often kept money at those banks because of the too big to fail uh, notion instead of looking at smaller banks around the country. And by smaller banks, I'm not talking about very small banks. I'm talking about really just non-SIFI banks, 50 billion, uh, you know, and below. This bill has also been important because it now allows, it's created a foundation for banks to use these products as a long-term and stable funding strategy. If you think about the fact that previously these deposits had to be uh, formed or had to be treated as reciprocal, I, I'm sorry, had to be treat, treated as brokered deposits. The problem was that if a bank ever fell below well capitalized, they would immediately have to device, divest themselves of these deposits. With this uh, bill, the change in, in treatment of these bills, banks can now be adequately capitalized and maintain the deposits that they had on their balance sheet when they fell from well to adequately capitalize. So from a risk perspective, from a stress perspective, these deposits have now become much more attractive for banks because they do not have to divest of them if they lose their well capitalized status. So with that, I thought we'd quickly run through what is an FDIC program. And a reciprocal program is just a component of what an FDIC insured cash program is. Now, normally the way these programs work with banks is that money is swept out of a DDA account to, um, into the DDM program. So if a client has a million dollars and they want that money fully FDIC insured, bank may sweep anything over 250 into our program. We simply then take that $750,000 allocated on a tax ID basis to as many banks as necessary, in this case, three banks in increments of $250,000. Allocate that money to three other banks uh, around the country that are involved in our program, and then give the, the originating bank, the bank that brought that customer in, the ability to potentially take those funds back. 
if they and and when I say potentially, it depends on their desire, not uh, a question of availability. It's important that that you you know when when new programs are done this way, when they're used out of sweep programs out of a customer's checking account, customers have access to their ba balances on a daily basis. There is no real imp impact. There is no impact actually to the way that a customer behaves on a daily basis. They write a check, that check will get cleared. They wire money out, that wire will get done. They have full, customers have full access to these deposits on a daily basis. And most importantly is your bank continues to be the sole interface with your customer. One of the critical components for us is that we do not want your customers as our customers they are in fact your customers and you are our customers we will do everything in our power to support you with your customers but we don't want to ever be in a situation where a customer is in any way shape or form confused as to whether they call us or call you we really give them no means to call us directly now as I indicated uh, before, a reciprocal program is simply part of an FDIC sweep program. And what's important here to understand is that you as a bank decide how much money or if you want to take money back from the program based upon the amount of the money uh, that you put in, into the program. So your customers get millions of dollars of FDIC insurance, high net worth individuals, businesses, municipalities, others. They get to keep daily liquidity on their, on their product. And you get to decide whether or not those deposits are going to come back to you. So if, for example, you wanted all the money that you put into the program to come back to you, you have 10 clients, 5 clients, 50 clients, whatever it might be that put in a million, a hundred million, five hundred million dollars, whatever the amount might be, you can decide that on a daily basis you want that money back and, and whatever you put into the program you take back. You can also decide that if you put in a million dollars, as this, this chart indicates, you only want to take seven hundred and fifty thousand back or five hundred thousand back. You have the ability to do that on an account by account basis on an overall relationship basis. Really, quite frankly, if you can think up how much money you want back in terms of how much money you sent in, we can provide you with a tool that will allow you to uh, pinpoint the amount of money that you want to take back from this program. So just because you put money into the program doesn't mean you have to take money back or it doesn't mean you have to take that exact amount back. But to the extent that you do, that is what we refer to as a reciprocal deposit. Also want to talk about reciprocal plus, reciprocal minus. All that means is that you put a dollar in, you take something less than a dollar back, or you take something more than a dollar back. Again, it's very important to understand that with these programs, the amount that you take back does not have to be exactly the same as the amount that you put in. Now, there are situations where <clears throat> A bank may not want to take money back. We call that a send-only relationship. So you are sending us money on behalf of your customers. Very simply, you, you know, I think with every bank, their ability to grow deposits and their ability to grow loans do not always work in lockstep. Sometimes deposits run faster than loans. And this product gives you a tool to allow both sides of the bank to continue to move as hard and as fast as possible to generating new customers and new, new loans and new deposits without worrying about the other side. So in a send-only relationship, what you're able to do is simply take those customers, send them into our program, we allocate them to other banks, and pay you interest. You have the ability then to generate fee income off of those customers by paying them a number less than what we, we pay you. You can earn a spread. There's no limit 
to what you can in earn and spread. It's simply what you can convince your customers to accept as a, as a rate of return or a, or a deposit rate on this product, just like you do with any other deposit product that you provide them. But most importantly, what this allows you to do is inventory or warehouse deposits for future use. So if you're growing the deposit side of your balance sheet quicker than the loan side of your balance sheet, you can use this program, have 50 million, 5 million, 100 million, 200 million, whatever the number is, depending upon the size of your organization, put into this program, but not reciprocate it back. So that when you start making loans, when your loan growth catches up to your deposit growth, you simply call us and say, I have $100 million in customer funds in your program. I'm currently not taking anything back or taking back some number less than that $100 million. We've had loan growth. We need the deposits. We now want to take all of those deposits back. By clicking a switch, we will simply then change you from whatever number you were getting back in deposits before to 100% reciprocal. You put 100 in, now you're going to take 100 back. So it provides you with the ability to allow both sides of your bank to go full steam ahead without worrying about causing problems for the balance sheet. It allows the treasury staff and the bank to maximize the use of the capital, maximize the size of the balance sheet, and not just be holding deposits, paying customers for something that they're going to just turn around and leave at the Fed or put in treasuries or something where they can't make what they believe is an acceptable rate of return. Now, on the other side of the coin, there might be a situation where your bank is growing considerably faster from a loan perspective than they are from a deposit perspective. You can also use these programs to simply take deposits, uh, you know, take down deposits from the program. So, for instance, if you're not sending customer money in, but you want deposits, you can call us and ask us for a million, five million, ten million, fifty million, whatever the number is that you might need. And based on market availability, we'll, we'll be able to provide you with those deposits. It also could be a situation where you are sending customer money in to the program, but you're sending in 20 and you want 50. So you ask us for an extra 30. We can provide you with that. Again, that is what we would describe as a receive-only type of a structure. This gives you another funding source. You, we know that you have a variety of funding sources, but this is, is yet another funding source. It is a liquid funding source. So you're not locking yourself into one year, two years, three years, six months, whatever it might be from a funding perspective. You can de determine how long you want the funding for. Very liquid uh, source of funding. So if you, you think about these programs, I mean, again, we want to go back and focus on uh, reciprocal specifically. What we see in the market right now is, an, it is a significant demand for these programs that's centered around reciprocal deposit. We see banks moving away from collateralized deposits, freeing up that collateral for other use, whether that is straight collateral that they have on their balance sheet or some type of a, a collateral provided by the home loan uh, in the form of some kind of uh, type of letter of credit or line of credit. We find that for most banks, collateral acquisition is expensive. And again, to the extent that you can free up, whether it's your own collateral or home loan lines, it gives you a source of collateral for future funding to the extent that you need it. Why not, it's, 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 it's equivalent to an individual having a line of credit. Doesn't help in most instances, but when you need money, that money is there. If you're able to free up collateral, it's the same type of situation where you are now able to borrow money when you need it because you have that collateral uh, available. Usually that's collateral that's already been pledged to the home loan, and it's, it's available to now, now to you in, in the form of home loan advances at an instance notice. Um, 
Another point about, about the program that I want to make is as, as you are dealing with your customers, you have complete control over the rate that you pay your customers. The rate that we pay you on send-only deposits has nothing to do with the rate that you choose to pay your clients. If you're able to place the, if you're able to get customers to place money into the into the your bank or into this program at 25 basis points, your cost cost of funding will be 25 basis points plus whatever our fee might be. Our fees start at 10 basis points. You decide what the rates are to your customers. If you're in a, in a market where rates are significantly higher, you can choose to pay a number that's higher than the rate that we set your cost of funding will be based upon the rate that you end up paying your customer. Now, this is one of the simplest, yet I think most important charts that we can show as we're talking about these products as it pertains to reciprocal deposits. You can choose, just like a gas grill, how much and how full of reciprocity you want to take it at a given time. You can turn it up, you can turn it down, you can allow us to help you to maximize your balance sheet. Again, you put 100 million into the program, you only take 50 million back because that's what the needs of your balance sheet are. We're often asked what type of accounts are able to use a product such as this. And the answer is anything. Um, any kind of an account that you can open up on your books is an account that we can take into our program. Because again, all we are doing is putting that money in checking accounts and savings accounts at other banks. So this is a list of customers that often might need to use products because often they will need or want higher levels of FDIC insurance. <clears throat> we find that a lot of small businesses, businesses, certainly municipalities are probably, municipalities I would say are, are the single largest type of customer that uses these programs. And banks will often look to these programs as a way of, of uh, being able to aggressively court municipal deposits into their uh, into their bank but all of these customer types can make use of the program over time as we think about how this product is used by the end customer we think very strongly that there are three things every depositor investor, whatever term you want to use for somebody with funds when they're placing money, whether it's in a bank deposit or some type of competing product, there are three things that those investors slash depositors need to think about at all times. One is the credit of wherever they're placing money, one is the liquidity, and the third would be the yield. From a credit perspective, Again, every dollar placed into this program up to our insurance limit of $25 million is going to be fully FDIC insured at all times. We give to you, we expect that you will make available to your customers a list of all of the banks in our program so that they, so they and you can determine what banks are appropriate for them to have in their account. If a customer of yours already has a relationship with another bank, they can simply tell us they don't want a relationship with that bank, thereby ensuring that they're never going to have money in our program and money outside of our program in the same bank and therefore not being FDIC insured. That same tool can be used by you as a bank um, to not allow customer money to go to competitor organizations or things of that nature. From a credit perspective, I, I you know, I think I'm, I'm speaking the obvious when I say there's never been a loss to a depositor or an FDIC insured deposit in the history of the FDIC. And all of the new banks that come into our program are well capitalized. The only adequately capitalized money that can ever be in our program are banks that have fallen below well capitalized, but they're still allowed to maintain the adequately, uh, I'm sorry, the deposits that they had in the program from a reciprocal perspective 
as long as they remain adequately capitalized. And we as a bank, uh, I'm sorry, we as an, an intermediary have never had a failure in any of our programs. Liquidity. <clears throat> Again, every dollar placed into the program on behalf of your customers is placed into a checking or a savings account. There is no limit on the number of transactions that your clients can, can do with us. They can have a, a, a transaction every day. You can have a transaction with us every day. No money is placed in CDs, so there's never any issue about money being tied up. And we can offer liquidity up until as late as 315 uh, on a daily basis, depending upon how you're providing us information. Obviously, no risk of principal. I'm sorry, no, you get no risk to your principal. There's no fluctuating NAV the way there is in money funds. This is strictly a, a bank deposit. From a yield perspective, we, can, we believe strongly that the, the uh, offering that we have is very attractive relative to other options. I think on a long-term basis, it's fair to say that the yield that you can expect out of this program will mirror Fed funds over time. Right now, it's 183 basis points. Fed funds is at 182. That's uh, you know a relationship that has uh, stayed pretty much intact through the life of this product. Um, and there's no reason why that won't continue going forward. Um, Crane Government Index, which is an index of, of, in, of institutional uh, money funds, yielded 176, while the Crane Government uh, Fund Index yielded only 147 basis points. So I think to the extent that somebody chooses to use this product on a send-only basis, uh, where they don't want the funds back and are simply taking the yield that we offer to you and passing it along to your clients, there certainly is some room there um, for you to take out some fees and earn some, earn, earn some fee income. Now, one of the important things about the use of this program is the integration of this program into your core banking system, or for that matter, one thing we haven't talked about is your core trust and accounting system for those of of you that have uh, bank trust funds. We are currently integrated with um, basically all of the major bank plan uh, uh, platforms, core banking systems list here, as well as for each of these firms, obviously I have more than one um, um, system. We're integrated not only with one of their systems, but in almost all cases, all of their systems. On the trust and accounting side, we're integrated with effectively all of the major trust and accounting systems. This is one of the areas that we're beginning to see significant movements by banks who have large trust customers, uh, I'm sorry, trust departments with large numbers of customers and large amounts of cash that are simply flowing out of the bank to a large mutual fund company. And the bank who has spent all of this time and effort Cultivating this customer base is not getting access to those customers. We have built integration with all of the trust and accounting systems so that it can be turnkey for, for bank trust departments to send money into our program and then allow the parent bank to reciprocate those deposits to the extent that they are interested in having more deposits on the balance sheet. Now, some of the realities of how this process would actually work with all of these core banking systems is relatively simple. Banks would analyze, each, each of you would analyze what the activity of your customers is. Any customer that you decide is appropriate to put into this program where you want to take deposits that might be at another organization, that might be in another type of product, that might be in a collateralized deposit currently. You set a peg balance within your core system for each account. When that customer's balance goes above that system, money sweeps into our program. When it goes below that system, money sweeps out of our program. The core system creates that transaction on a daily basis, sends us that information overnight um, so that your customers will always be fully FDIC insured. And you will have the ability to, to determine on a client-by-client -client basis 
what is the right amount to keep on uh, um, uh, on balance sheet directly and what is the right amount um, to move into this program. That will be determined really by the volatility, the daily activity that a specific customer has. The ease of use of this product will also allow many banks to get access to customers that has not been able to access before. Um, because it can be done in such a simple manner, it um, is something that allows you to go after credit sensitive and municipal customers in a very seamless way, allowing you to penetrate those markets with much greater ease. Now, in the trust in and accounting side uh, of, of a bank, um, these product, the integration has been set up to allow this product to be used as a sweep vehicle on all of those wealth management accounts. And that allows the bank to monetize all of those cash holdings as a reliable and stable source of funding. Money funds don't offer, you know, the normal product that a wealth management department within a bank uses is, is a money fund. Money funds offer no benefit to the bank and you're simply shipping money that you've tried very long and hard to get into the bank out to a third party organization. This is a way that either A, you can reciprocate those deposits and keep them on your balance sheet, or B, put them as a send only and again, warehouse those deposits so that when you have future loan growth, those deposits are, are, are there and are available for you to reciprocate. As is the case with the uh, core banking systems, you have the ability to determine your rate that is paid out to these customers within your wealth management department at all times. You dictate that rate, we never do. So just, just as an overview, um, we believe strongly that with the passage of the financial reform bill in 2018, reciprocal deposits are now something that fits very strongly into a bank's core funding strategy. They're, they are now much more regulator um, comfortable, shall we say, since <laughs> there has been the effective stamp of approval of, of the federal government on them. Our program is daily liquid, provides $25 million in insurance per tax ID. And the per tax ID is important because we don't allocate our balances on a per account basis we allocate them on a tax ID basis. So if you have a customer that has multiple accounts, we will take those multiple accounts into consideration when we allocate for, for both or more than two of their accounts. It's very seamless in that it can be used as a sweep, shop, sweep option for core customers. Uh, I'm sorry, for core bank customers, you know, through the DDA sweep functionalities. It also can be used as a position traded basis for, cust for large customers that want to deposit money for defined periods of time where you don't necessarily have their, um, their core banking account. Their core banking account might be at another institution, but this is a way to get some amount of deposits without being their daily volatility bank. And again, it can be used for trust and wealth management departments to gain access to new customers for the bank's balance sheet. So I just wanted to you know, say thank you again for the time today. I hope, hope this was helpful. It was meant to be a you know, brief overview of how these products work. Uh, and with that, we'd be happy to uh, take any questions. Uh, I see that we have the first question we have uh, is a question regarding the compatibility of this product with CSI. The answer is yes, that it is compatible with CSI. We have customers already using it, and I uh, would love to talk to you about the possibility of, uh, you know, for those people that are using it now to, to, um, um, uh, to consider the use of the product. And Janine, if you had any other uh, questions um, that you've received, I do, Tom. Thanks. So, guys, before we, um, you know, get into Q&A, just a reminder as we go through that, 
to take advantage of the platform to download the slide deck if you're interested. If you join late, um, all you need to do is go to Event Resources on the left side of your screen there, click on that drop-down menu, and you can download the slides right from the platform without being disconnected. So you might want to take advantage of that as we go through Q&A. Okay, Tom, first question. What paperwork does our client need to sign to enter the program? So uh, the way that the uh, legal relationship would work uh, on this program is that Rich and Tang would sign an agreement with your bank um, that would be a, you know an overarching agreement. Within that agreement, there would then be terms and conditions that we recommend you pass along to your clients. One of the key things about our program is that we do not require a specific contract of any type um, um, to be signed between your, your client and us, or even your client and you. You have the flexibility of creating whatever type of document fits in with the rest of your contracting with your client um, and are, are not forced to use what I would call a cookie cutter contracting process. Um, you, can, you can dictate how this will fit in with the suite of agreements that you might ask a client to sign you put it on your own letterhead to the extent that you want, use your own fonts and things of that nature to ensure that this looks again like it's your product and not like it's ours. So the long and short is that you sign an agreement with us that allows you to use the product on behalf of your customers, and then it's up to you on how you think it's most appropriate to have your client agree to use the product um, um, with you, and then ultimately on to us. Okay, Tom. Next question is, Tom, are there any limits on what rates we pay our customers? No, uh, no there aren't. Uh, your customers, uh, again, depending upon what rate, you know, what it, what it simply comes down to is is whatever rate you can convince your customers to accept as, as an appropriate rate for how whatever your relationship is, you can pass that along. Whether that's 25 basis points or, God forbid, 250 basis points, you have the ability to set that rate at whatever number you want. Perfect. Um, what are a few key differences between ICS and DDM? I think one of the, the, the key differences, what we find is, is one is integration. Our integration is uh, directly built into the cores and in many cases in a manner that is much more uh, simple to use for banks uh, than it is with ICS. I think one of the big differences is our contracting process. You have the full flexibility of how you want to contract with your end customers and how to fit that in um, with your customer service versus our understanding with ICS that um, you know there's there's much more of a cookie cutter type of a contract that they need to sign uh, indicating ICS. So that there's a little bit more flexibility there. And, and I think clearly our customer support from our perspective is significantly um, uh, stronger um, than, and much, much more hands-on uh, than it would be for ICS. Our fee, you know, it, which leads into another question I see here, which is about our fees. Our fees tend to be lower as well. Our fees are, are 10 basis points for reciprocal deposits. Um, and there are no fees for the use of our product from either a um, send-only or receive-only basis. So there are no wire fees, there are no sign-up fees, there are no transaction fees. On, on send-only and receive-only, there are no fees on reciprocal. There's a, a straight 10 basis point fee structure. 
Okay. Um, this next one, I'm going to kind of jump down here to, could you tell me again how to get the slides, which again, I will mention, but there's also a question attached. So check out event resources on the left side of your screen. You'll see a little drop down menu there. Click on that and then um, it will allow you to download the deck. So the second part of that question, Tom, can I get details on how these accounts and tra transactions work on our books? Certainly. I mean, we, uh, we, you know, we'll follow up with you separately, but we have a, uh, what we call an operations guide that will show the types of accounts that you would set up, how you treat these uh, deposits uh, on your call reports, and um, you know how that whole process would work from a books and records perspective. I don't think it's something I can necessarily answer, you know, here, but we're happy to follow up with you and give you all of those details um, uh, after this presentation. Yeah. Um, I see one uh, one last que question. I think is uh, about FIS Horizon and whether or not we are compatible with FIS Horizon. Again, the answer to that question would be yes. So we, we, you know, for those that use FIS Horizon, uh, we can integrate for you. Great. I have a couple more, Tom, if, if you have time. I um, do. Can we do more than 20% of our total liabilities in reciprocal deposits? There is the, nothing in, in the CRAPO bill limits the amount that you can do in these types of deposits, it only limits the amount that you can treat as core. So for a, a bank that wants to do, let's say, 25% of its, of its assets in reciprocal deposits, they'd simply treat 20% of those as core, 5% would then have to be treated as, as brokered going forward. It's still a, a an attractive product. It, it's a product that didn't start because of the CRAPO bill. It's been around for a long time. So many banks would find an attraction to use this product, even if it had to find, even if it had to treat the deposits as brokered. Uh, but but there is no limit on the amount that a bank can do. Okay, and then some clarification here. So, Tom, the question is: Are all programs not considered brokered? Because wouldn't receive only be considered brokered? Uh, yes. So the, 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 when we discuss the fact that these deposits are not considered brokered, we're talking purely about reciprocal deposits. So if a bank chooses to uh, just take funds from the program or chooses to take more funds from the program than they're sending in, what we referred to originally as reciprocal plus, um, the amount in excess of what they send into the program would have to be considered brokered. So if you send nothing in and take $20 million out, $20 million is brokered. If you send $15 million in and take twenty million out, the difference between the two or $5 million would be brokered. Fifteen would be core. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. And seeing no more questions, I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. I also want to thank Tom for sharing his expertise with us today. Later this week, watch for a follow-up email. It will contain a link to the recording of today's webinar. That concludes our webinar. Thanks again. Have a great day.